The data supporting increased membership of the Church of Latter-day Saints is a bit ambiguous, considering its trends are centered around COVID and the pandemic's impact on society. Scott, tell us more about the unclear data and why we should care, if at all. Sure. Well, as April tulips bloom, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints unveils its annual statistics amid fervent speculation. Two contrasting narratives emerge, one suggesting that the church is inevitably declining, the others championing its unwavering growth. Yet amidst this seeming paradox, a plea for perspective arises, emphasizing the neutrality of data and the complexity of religious dynamics. While 2023 showcased modest growth, both globally and in the United States, deeper analysis reveals nuanced challenges. Despite marginal increases in membership and missionary activity, concerns linger over dwindling birth rates and waning commitment. The juxtaposition of these narratives underscores the intricate landscape of Latter-day Saint demographics, where optimism meets apprehension in the face of evolving religious landscapes. The story is from the Salt Lake Tribune by Justin McClellan, and it was released on April 13th, 2024. So there's a lot of data packed into this story where it could support potentially uh, a, a rise in Latter-day Saints church, uh, you know, attendance, excuse me. And then, uh, but there are some nuances that we're missing. Richard, you suggest that the world becoming more educated could lead to a decline in the belief of the LDS dogma. But Considering that there is still so much religion out there in the world that exists, is, is this a matter of education or could it be something else? Well, it's a combination of two things, education and indoctrination. As long as the religious people that exist keep indoctrinating their kids and don't let them learn how to be critical thinkers, we're going to continue to have some growth in religion because that's where it comes from. That's where it's always come from. Uh I give myself as a perfect example. I was not indoctrinated into anything. Uh, and I grew up to be a wonderful skeptical thinker. Well, I, you know, I mean, one, probably. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you can you can play with that all you want, but uh, in any case, the point is this if you if I'll go back to one simple statistic. The vast majority of people have the same religion as their parents or the cultural mm -hmm. group they grew up in. Mm -hmm. now, what does mm -hmm. that tell you about where it comes from? Yeah. Uh, well, Scott, people say that numbers don't lie. So when we look at this data, is there really anything wrong with reading these numbers that show there is actually an, an increase in church attendance in the LDS church? Um, what are your thoughts on that one? Uh, well, I would say n the numbers don't lie, but the interpretation of those numbers can, uh, that's, that's where the confusion can come in, or the even sometimes uh, intentional misleading can, can happen there. And it's all about, it's all the way that, that it's interpreted. Uh, uh, Richard Feynman, the physicist, once said that if, you're, if, you're, um, if your theory conflicts with observation, then you're wrong. And so, uh, so here, the numbers are just a reflection of reality. OK, they gathered that uh, we're assuming that that it's, uh, you know, that they used a decent methodology in gathering this data. But the data just reflects what they found. And so it's the interpretation that's the problem. And I think uh, in that regard, I think this data is really um, I mean, we've just got we're, we're still on the on the rebound from this uh, massive, massive worldwide pandemic. Uh, it's something that. Uh, rarely happens, if ever, in the world. And so our, our normal uh, interpretation of data has to adjust. And I, I think that uh, if you look at the, at the data that they're showing, they show a drastic drop off in 2020 mm -hmm. uh, and, then a, and then an increase, uh, even a slight increase to above where it was before of their new, mem new baptisms and their new children. And, uh, but we have, to, we have to consider the fact that this pandemic can have more of an effect than just that one particular year. For example, uh, if somebody wants to baptize their child into the, uh, the Mormon church and, uh, and, and a pandemic just hit, they're not going to just say, oh, screw it, and then we're not going to do it, right? They're going to put it off for a year. So you would expect there to be some kind of bounce back. Same thing. If somebody wants to be baptized into the church, they're not going to say, oh, well, I guess I'm not going to be a Mormon because of COVID. Uh, no, they're just going to say, well, let's wait until things calm down and then we're going to go back in. And so you can there's analysis that can be done uh, to show that uh, that, yeah, numbers are increasing and that's fine. But 
interpreting those numbers to mean that enrollment is on the rise, I think is way too soon, way, yeah. way too soon. We, we need to, we need to reestablish baselines in this new paradigm. Well, I want to compare that to other baselines that we know exist. And Jonathan, I have to turn again to you and your military experience as I frequently do. But uh, when we look at uh, years where the economy is down, things like military recruitment go up, college enrollment goes up. Uh, and as the economy improves, jobs tend to, uh, well, be more available and this correlation reverses. People leave the military, people stop going to school and they go to work. Is But the opposite seems to be happening here. OK, so uh, the impact that COVID had kind of having an opposite effect. So does Scott have a point? Uh, is this a bounce back or is there something else that we're missing? Well, um, well, in the military, we call those economic draftees. But um, the the church growth, um, well, growth and influence of any church is nonlinear. So you're going to see fluctuations due to things like the pandemic. I agree with Scott on that. It's gonna affect the numbers. But if you take out the pandemic years, um, it's likely they picked up where they left off because um, the overall population of LDS adherents has risen over the ten year, uh, last 10 years, pretty consistent growth of about 1% per year. So when you're looking at these, uh, uh, you also have to take into account of what are the percentages based on? Is it is it just their thing, or is that uh, what's how does the percentage of the growth of the U.S. population as a whole affect that? Um, you know, how many of the group that they're drawing their new converts from is actually available to them, and if that grows, then you might see some growth also. So there's a lot of nuance to this that is very difficult. To, to parse out if you don't have the actual study and you don't have access to the actual numbers and where they got them from. Because mm -hmm. there can be a lot of distortion, like, you know, like uh, I agree with Scott, there can be a lot of distortion in the analysis of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not mm -hmm. a statistician, though I do have one in my family. Um, and I can tell you that I, I would love to get them and to, to look at the study and see what they think of it, because that would be an interesting conversation. Whoa. However, um, we don't have the actual study. We have reporting on the actual study. Yeah. And so go ahead, finish up real quick. And then I want to jump over to Richard. Well, I'm, I'm, it's just that one of the things that happens is that uh, we need to uh, get more into the weeds on that. And we don't really have time here to do it, but you know, uh, there's, you know, there is a few other points that could be made, but uh, I don't think they're, you know, really relevant now that we've gone this far. Well, on that note, you know, I want to get back to the point that, that Richard made as far as education is concerned, you know, is educating our, our youth is educating our society really whittling this down. Um, Richard, what do we have to do in order to ensure that people are not just indoctrinated generation after generation and allowing this kind of, uh, you know, I guess, perpetuity of the, these ridiculous beliefs. Um, what are the what are the steps we need to take as a society to ensure that we can stall that from happening? Well, one, one of the things that that we're doing is the kind of programs we put on here because we get to young adults, hopefully, and if their minds get opened and they start looking at things and start questioning, and then when they have kids, they don't, you know, send them off to be indoctrinated. Uh, I think that can really help. It, it, it's, you know, I, I mean, I'll just give you an example. When I went to high school, we had a class on civics taught us all about how the government works. Most school districts don't have that anymore. Kids grow up and they don't have an idea that there's three branches of government. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, that crazy. But I, I would love, and maybe Scott, maybe you're a teacher someday, we should talk about this. I'm thinking I got too many projects going on, but one of the projects is I'd like to put together a, a, a class for how to teach people to be, you know, critical thinkers, how to look at things and analyze them as opposed to, you know, you know, this probably better than I do, but I have a lot of friends that are teachers and, and, uh, these these standardized test stuff, you know, all it does is how well do you memorize something and can spit it back? That doesn't teach people how to think. You know, I mean, that's you know, okay. So you know that Washington was the first president, 
what were his politics? Mm. You know, what was what was going on there? I mean, the same thing about Jefferson and Madison. You know, those were the two guys that were pushing hard for keeping religion out of government. But you would never know that when you listen to some of these uh, uh, Christian apologists talk about it. We're a Christian nation. You know that? Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, uh, there's so much there. And, and especially now with people trying to ban books, they don't want people to learn about other cultures and just they're, they're trying to keep everything so tribal. So, you know, I grew up very luckily in a very mixed racial neighborhood and I had friends that were black, brown, Asian, Native American. I played sports with them. I had my advanced math classes with them. I saw some that were really bright, some that were, I mean, it was just a human panoply of things. That experience, you know, and learning with people. I had some really good teachers in high school and college that forced you to think not, they don't, they don't want any spitting back stuff. They demanded that you come up with some other ideas. And that's the kind of stuff that makes people look at things and go, you know, that doesn't sound right. I think I take a look at that. And so Uh, that's what's, that's what we got to move toward, you know? And I want to ask Scott, you know, cause you bring up a good point. Scott's a teacher and, and, you know, this education problem uh, or, or lack of education in these, these corners could definitely have uh, in, an impact on the growth of these, if, if on the growth of these organizations, if the proper education is not given Scott, what do you see in your circles? Uh, is education getting better over time, uh, and if not, is there is it helping along these this dogmatic thinking and allowing organizations like the LDS to kind of put a positive spin on some of these uh, some of these this data? Um, well, I mean, clearly, I have a biased opinion here, being being a teacher and in, in in the industry, and so um, you know we need to you know, my, take my words with a grain of salt. Um, first thing though, I want to, I want to clarify something when I was talking about bounce back, what I'm saying, I'm not saying that I think that's what was happening. What I'm saying is that the data can be used to create multiple narratives that are conflicting with each other. And so based off of that, we need to, we need to be concerned on what Richard was saying about, uh, about skeptical thinking. Your question now is, is, um, can we, um, you know, is education improving? Yeah, I think I think education, the educational system, I think is uh, much better than when I was in school. I think that, and again, I have a biased opinion here. I think the public attitude towards education though has changed quite a bit. Um, uh, parental attitudes, student attitudes, uh, administration attitudes, government attitudes. I think that. Um, I think it's getting harder and harder to do things just in general. And, and so uh, educating is, is one of those things that I, I think we're, we're coming up against uh, bigger and bigger challenges. We're having uh, a lesser administrative support. We're having constant pressures on, on budgets and things like that. And mm-hmm. we're, we're being asked to do more with less. Um, uh, and, and so it, it's, it's a complex uh miasma there to to try to analyze and so um you know we talk about on on all of the aca shows about how it's okay to say i don't know right if if you if you don't have enough information to make a conclusion one way or other one way or the other i think uh i think it's okay to say we don't know um you know we want to direct uh, we want to direct the investigation and we want to direct our information gathering so that we can get useful information to make improvements. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, th- I think I've, I know for me personally, I've improved as a teacher every year since I've started. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we try new things. We try changing things. Sometimes people like it. Sometimes they don't. But it's it's it's, uh, you know, the educational system doesn't live in a vacuum. And, That's and how- so. That, Sorry, that's how you get to that skeptical, that skeptical thinking, you know, that's how, you know, by, by making the improvements and analyzing the way that we do things, we get to that right. skeptical thinking so that we can say, I don't know. And to, to counter back to uh, your point about the bounce back, what I was saying is, you know, is this just a positive spin that, that shows a bounce back uh, from mm-hmm. the LDS, right? And so I think I could agree with you there where the, the LDS takes this data and they say, oh, look at us, look at our bounce back, right? But in reality, it's not necessarily what's happening. Uh, right, and so, right. And actually, I, I, I take, a, you know, I'm encouraged by the fact that I think, you know, the, the article itself did caution against interpreting the data one way or the, one way or the other and good on them uh, for doing that. But 
Um, normally an organization like this, and, and this is again, my, this is just my opinion and I'm, I'm an atheist activist. And so I'm biased uh, against religion, uh, in general, but, uh, to me, it seems like this would be exactly the kind of thing where the church would want to pretty it up and would want yeah. to present it as being nicer than it is. So the fact that they're cautioning, um, you know, jumping to conclusions, to me, makes me suspicious that, well, maybe it's worse than what they're presenting, right? Maybe so, maybe when they pretty it up to get it up to the point of, of you know, of I don't know, then, you know, to me, that's, that's uh, encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to, we got to move to, to Jonathan. Jonathan, you had some interesting points to make about all this data um, and, you know, reading over kind of uh, what your thoughts were here. You, you, do you care to expand on, on some of these, uh, some of these numbers that the LDS is championing? Yeah. Um, like I said, the, there's the, the growth um, is interesting when you, you take a look at some of the numbers. Um, if, if you take into account actual population growth in the, in the U.S., 0.49 percent. So you're, if you're taking into account births and deaths, um, it, it's, it's almost like 0.5 percent, right? Half a percent. Um, and if they're growing at 1 percent per year, they're, as a percentage of the population, it's kind of, eh, you know, it's not really that impressive. Mm. Um, so, you know, uh, the the numbers include those, of course, who are still on the rolls, but do not practice or tithe or loosely are loosely affiliated, meaning they only go when they kind of have to, you know. Um, and that is, is something that it, it kind of shows that, yeah, numbers can be deceptive when you don't when you try and unspin them, you know, uh, um, worldwide LDS growth was 1.49%, you know, uh, which is compared to the 0.49 of population growth worldwide of 73 million a year. Um, so it's like, yeah, that with their birth rates and things like that doesn't seem to be all that impressive. So again, big grain of salt with the report but again, they did try and balance it a little bit, but that can be just another, you know, way to make it look presentable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, I, have a, I have a thought about something that, that Scott said earlier, somebody else might have said it about, you know, um, the, the statistics don't lie. Uh, and then it's about interpreting. But I would I would go one step farther with a group like this. That's basic doctrines are so far from reality that um, let's put it this way. People that report statistics can lie. People that collect them mm -hmm. can lie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, when I when I look at polling, the first thing that I want to know about a poll is who asked the questions? What were the exact questions and who were they asked of? Because otherwise, a poll doesn't mean a damn thing. Mm -hmm. I could create a poll and talk to a thousand people and, and get exactly what I wanted by taking it to certain neighborhoods and posing the question, you know, like that, that, that funny old question, are you still beating your wife? You know, <laughs> that presupposes an answer. So, so mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, but they do that in polls. They, they, I get polls all the time. I'm going to you know, all the time. And some of them are just so ridiculous that they don't have good options yeah, in there to even sure. want to vote on. So I, you know, I mean, I don't know how many of you folks have read the Book of Mormon, but there's nothing in there that tells me anybody's being rational and yeah. that they could even maybe not even <laughs> count right. I'm sorry, but you know. And that, um, that goes to the larger point that I think everybody made, right? So uh, we have, we have Richard, you brought up the point of education. Um, we, and when we had Jonathan uh, and Scott talking about how data can be used to kind of skew uh, the truth. And, you know, when you have poor education or you have a, a way to kind of use data to your advantage, we end up with this, uh, perpetuity of people just believing the wrong thing, you know, because you can take really any information that you have, whether it's through a really poor education system or a lack of complete data and spin your own message. And this is how we see this generational, uh, this generational, I guess, uh, I don't know what the what the right term I'm looking for is, but we're just stuck. You know, we're just stuck in a in a 
a position where we're not moving on. And so on that note, um, I want to get everybody's opinion one last time. Scott, I'm going to go to you first. Jonathan, I'm going to come to you. And then Richard will close out this segment with you. So, Scott, go ahead. Sure. I, I think this is a great example. Uh, one of the things that I tell my students, I teach an intro statistics class, and one of the things that I tell them is that one of the best reasons to learn math and to learn statistics is so that you can't be manipulated and tricked by other people who know more math than you. And so knowledge is power. And so it's right there for the taking. Take a statistics course. Jonathan. And yeah, and, uh, and don't believe it that just because it's math, your eyes glaze over and you shut down. Um, math is fun, actually. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I enjoyed math all the way through school. And I think that uh, uh, you, there's some really great teachers out there. But again, you have to be aware of not just what your formal fallacies and your informal fallacies are and how to think critically, but you also have to be able to use how numbers can be used to model and mm. that and how they can use, be used to deceive. I think education is key. What we've, what we've come across here. And I want to, I want to uh, pitch that to Richard since that was his, his original thought. So go ahead and close out uh, what your thoughts are on this segment. Well, uh, you know, I'll just off the top of my head, I, I think I would have rather had a discussion about their doctrine, uh, but the, the numbers <laughs> here are, are, are interesting, but you know, they're so non-differential in one respect. I don't know if it makes much difference. It, there was no big drop off or big gain. Um, you know, somebody wrote an article and we picked it up. You know, I just think we have to uh, look carefully about these things and worry more about what's, you know, what's happening. I mean, I, the fact that Scott is teaching a, a beginning statistics class, I think that's fantastic because, um, the more I, I'm a math guy. I was, I was like one of the top math kids in my school when I was in school and, and I loved it and I still in love it. And, and it's funny, I use it all the time in various funny little ways, which I won't bore you with, but there's just things that you run into in life where, you know, uh, knowing how to do things like that and understand things mathematically makes life easier and more well, understandable. Math certainly is fun to quote the great Jonathan Rodebush. And, uh, you know, <laughs> we, we, we owe it to ourselves to be able to interpret things honestly. Uh, we owe it to our generations that come after us to give them the tools to be able to do that as well. Uh, and so folks, if you want to see more content like this, please click on the link below.